Good evening and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the Constitution, the news of the day, and a legal perspective into your home each month. Tonight, myself, James Barrett, with Mark Malachowski, will bring three new subjects to you. Mark, what's our first subject tonight? Well, we're going to start out with Kerry Kennedy, gotten a little uh, brush up with the law uh, back in February, or maybe before that, but she went to trial on uh, February 28th. Isn't Carrie Kennedy the daughter of Robert Kennedy? Yeah, she is the daughter of Robert Kennedy who was, uh, was assassinated in, yeah. uh, in Los Angeles in the 1970s and the 1970s. In the early 70s, yeah, and that's, uh, that's an unfortunate tragedy because he was looking to be the potentially the next president mm -hmm. of the United States because of his popular backing. But let's go back to Carrie. Now, what did Carrie do? Well, Carrie um, allegedly was uh, driving under the influence. Uh, she was driving. There were some uh, reports that she was weaving. But she ended up uh, sideswiping a tractor trailer. Okay, well, was she, had she been drinking? Well, we don't know about the drinking, but apparently uh, she had, was, had, was under the influence of some kind of prescription medicine similar to Ambien. Okay, and well, we're, well, when we're talking about Ambien, we're obviously talking about a sleep, a sleep aid that people normally take at night before they go to bed so they can go to sleep. Why would she be driving uh, while she's on Ambien? Well, according to her testimony, um, she said that uh, she had a lot of pill bo bottles out on the counter, and I think she was ma taking a, something for another ailment, a thyroid uh, remedy or something like that. And she mistakenly grabbed the Ambien bottle and took a pill out of that bottle. Well, uh, from my understanding, Ambien is not a matter of you take one pill of Ambien. Uh, Ambien is, a, is normally a low enough dosage that you would have to have taken more than one pill. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how many she claims she took, but she just claims she got the bottles mixed up. Well, I understand from the, from the report was that she actually was weaving in and out of traffic and then sideswiped a big rig trailer, right. and, they found, and the police found her asleep at the, at the scene of the accident. Yeah, allegedly she was slumped over the wheel uh, with the car, you know, crashed into the, the tractor-trailer truck. Okay, so uh, didn't they give her a field sobriety test at the time? They found her to be unable to perform any of the simple tasks of a field sobriety test? Well, you know, those field sobriety tests are voluntary, and I, I don't know if she participated. I, the, the report I read, I'm not sure if she, she, she went ahead and did those or not. But uh, uh, I think having crashed into the uh, uh, tractor trailer was probably probable cause for, for an arrest in a lot of ways. Yeah. Okay, so was, but did the officer at the scene make the finding that she was intoxicated? Well, they arrested her for that. I, I don't know. And the report I read, I was just reading about the trial and what, what her defense was in trial. Well, let's see. Uh, I, I did see something about this. What was her defense at trial? She said that she didn't know she had taken Ambien. She didn't know she was on Ambien, and she didn't think she had taken any kind of prescription. And she had a prescription for the Ambien, and she, ha she didn't knowingly take anything that would have put her under the influence. Well, uh, from my understanding, Ambien is a drug that creates a hypnotic state. And while you're on Ambien, a person can drive, eat, drink alcohol, and, but still not know that they're even on Ambien or still not even know what they're doing. So is there an opportunity to believe that maybe she took it anyway and she just didn't know what she was doing? Well, the prosecution uh, called her a liar and said that... Uh, she should have noticed that she was under the influence of something and pulled over, you know, when she started feeling the effects. Uh, she said that uh, she doesn't really recollect all that. She just knows that she woke up and, you know, she'd hit the truck, but she didn't have an opportunity to notice she was under the effects and, and, and stop driving. So I understand in Michigan they actually have part of the law says you have to intentionally <clears throat> be taking an intoxicant or a prescription medication. So her defense of taking it unintentionally actually took her out of the violation of the crime. Is that what happened? Well, I think we were in New York. 
I think we're in New York. Okay, I thought we were in Michigan. Uh, I don't know. I thought it was in New York. Okay, but uh, wasn't wasn't her testimony at trial? Was she just didn't know what she was taking? She said she grabbed the wrong bottle, so she didn't intend to take Ambien, but that's what she ended up taking by error, by mistake. But she was okay. Well, Ambien. She's intoxicated. We know that intoxication is either you're intoxicated or you're not intoxicated. She was intoxicated. So what, what the jury found that even though she was totally intoxicated, even though she had a prescription for Ambien, even though she'd been taking Ambien off and on for 10 years, that somehow that morning she didn't take an Ambien? Well, is what, that what the jury was told? What they were told is that she didn't intentionally take the Ambien. She thought she was taking a thyroid pill. She took an Ambien or a, a drug-like Ambien pill by mistake, and then she didn't realize it until she crashed into the truck. How far away from her, do you have any idea how far away from her home she was when she crashed? No, I, I don't know what the distance was. Okay, had she ever had a drunk driving before? I don't think so. I think this is her first. So this is her first offense. I think it's her first, yeah. And the first offense involving any kind of drug. Well, also, you know, it doesn't really matter what you're under the influence. A DUI is under the influence. It could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be anything. And what a lot of people don't understand is that you could be legally prescribed a drug by your doctor, but you may not be able to drive when you take that. Well, we understand that on all the pills, when you get bottles, uh, if you ever look at prescription pill bottles, you'll see that it says do not operate machinery or your car. Heavy equipment. Heavy equipment, and your doctors tell you don't be driving on it. So her excuse of I didn't know, is, it seems to be almost a little far flung if we were in the state of California. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think if you, if involuntary uh, intoxication, that could be a defense even for murder. Yeah, but an involuntary intoxication meant you had no, completely no concept that you were taking something. Well, that's what she claimed. She claimed yeah, well, that she didn't know she took Ambien. Well, I have a question. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't the, the jury be influenced by the Kennedy name to say that she, oh, she must be telling the truth? Well, the uh, prosecution brought that up, and they said, well, she's just trying to, you know, clear the good name of the Kennedys, and, you know, it, it's, it's because of that. Uh, but apparently that the jury didn't didn't go for that. I mean that that argument was made by the prosecution that uh, you know she shouldn't get away with it just because he was a candidate. Okay, I, I just noticed from my notes I have here, you know that uh, Carrie Kennedy used to be the wife of Andrew Cuomo, the the current the current governor of New York. So she's had she's had a very uh, uh, somewhat uh, public lifestyle. Right. And you would believe that somebody that has a public lifestyle that's had Ambien prescribed to her for over 10 years, knowing that she's potentially taking a drug, even though she says she didn't know, that there's, a, there's an opportunity here to believe that this potentially sh this was a jury nullification, so to speak, because of the Kennedy. <laughs> so what you're saying is that you think maybe the prosecution went after her because she was a Kennedy? I believe both. I believe under <coughs> two, two theories. I two believe theories. that the prosecution believed that they went after her because she was a Kennedy because they're trying to make a, a point. But I also believe the jury could have easily decided that she's not guilty because she was a Kennedy because they believed her. Well, you went after her to understand that, yeah, I'm sure there's things on both sides. On one side, if you're a prosecutor, and you convict the Kennedy, I think that's a good way of making yourself a reputation. So I, you may want to go after a Kennedy where you wouldn't bother with someone else. Uh, and on the flip side, I think there is a certain amount of, you know, the, the Kennedys were kind of thought of as royalty, and they may have gotten, you know, some, some, uh, some leeway, some prestige where, you know, a regular person wouldn't have. Sure, the jury might have given them some sympathy. Yeah, I also noticed that uh, she had no memory of driving at all that morning. And that uh, there's, because she's never had any other event in her life that would tie to the use of the Ambien, that in reality, she, she almost got the benefit of the doubt of the jury, I believe. Well, I think that one of the indicators of Ambien is you might forget what happened. Yeah, and if you forget what happened and you forget that you took the Ambien or you, for, or you thought you were taking something else, Obviously, she had the opportunity to, to use that defense, 
and the jury bl believed her. Yeah, I've worked on an Ambien case before, and the Ambien is, uh, and also I think people think because, yeah, they take it before they go to bed, and it's not that strong of a drug, really. I think people maybe don't realize, you know, how, how, how much it affects them, too. Okay, well, listen, I think uh, that's enough on the Ambien issue because I will tell you, the Ambien is a controversial drug. A lot of people have had problems with it. Some people have sued over it. But I think it's time for us to move on. What's our second subject for tonight, Mark? Well, this is Senator Reid and what some people allege were Christmas presents. Um, and I guess in, in total of a, you know, over a couple years, I think this last in incident was 17000 but in total of something like $31,000, that went to Ryan Elizabeth. Well, who's Ryan Elizabeth? Well, that's kind of hard to figure out if you look at the campaign disclosure of the documents, but I, I guess a reporter went to some trouble and tracked down and tried to figure out who this uh, Ryan Elizabeth was. And there's actually uh, a woman who runs a grocery store, but also just coincidentally happens to be uh, Senator Reid's granddaughter. Well, yeah, I do understand that uh, this Ryan Elizabeth Reed, <coughs> is her full name. Well, that wasn't uh, on the document. Yeah, but that so. wasn't on the checks that he wrote. <coughs> it wasn't on the campaign it, disclosure. It wasn't on the campaign disclosure that. either. He forgot that part. <coughs> yeah, but he yeah, also he wrote read. these checks. The checks were written to a jewelry store right. that uh, she runs in Berkeley, <laughs> California. Right. And that uh, magically it uh, the money went to her. Um, and the, the, the idea here is it's campaign cash. So it's not like he wrote his personal <laughs> cash. <coughs> he me, actually man. wrote campaign from a campaign account to his granddaughter. Right, right. By the way, forgot to use her real last name, which is his son, because it's, I believe, his son's Corey's daughter. Uh, so her name is Reed. M uh, somehow, well, magically, he forgot to no, include the, the Reed but name. But on the campaign disclosure do do documents, he forgot to put Reed on the name. Yep. Well, uh, it's interesting. Um, and so there was about thirty-one thousand dollars there, and so that's kind of interesting. I guess that you know they're kind of looking. He apologized and said, "Sorry, oops," and uh, that kind of got glossed over. So it doesn't look like much is going to happen there. And that's kind of interesting because that's thirty-one thousand dollars, and some people might say that's an intentional omission. Whereas the other hand, the, you have a, a Dinesh D'Souza, and he made a, a, apparently a, something like a twenty thousand dollar donation. And I think that's over his limit of what you're supposed to donate to someone who was opposing uh, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, but uh, wasn't Mr. D'Souza also the one that made the Obama movie, Obama 216? Well, yeah. Wasn't he kind of targeted over that whole affair? Well, that's what uh, some people um, would uh, argue, that D'Souza made a movie, and it, it, the, the precept of the movie is that Obama's kind of a third world -less. He's an anti-colonialist, and, and people say, well, George Washington was an anti-colonialist. But that's not what is talking about. What is talking about is a third worldist who believes that, you know, collectivism works better than capitalism and that uh, the United States, Europe, Australia, and Japan, all the first world countries, took unfair advantage of the third world, and social justice won't be achieved until uh, the first world is brought to its knees and it's economically has economic parity with the third world. Well, this sounds more, not to get into too much of this, but sounds like more of distribution of the wealth, yeah. redistribution of the wealth. wealth yeah. And that would go along kind of with the agenda that we've been facing for the last six years. But that, but that, was, that was clearly indicated on, uh, during the initial election that, he, that the president wanted to have a redistribution of the wealth. Well, yeah, but what the president did, uh, just like he said, you can keep your health care and da-da-da-da, you can keep your doctor. He said, yeah, we're gonna, we have got the, you know, redistribute wealth. But what he implied they were going to redistribute the wealth from the rich people or the people who worked uh, in the United States and who had honestly earned good income. They were going to take that honestly earned income and redistribute to people who were a need-based uh, need, need -based government uh, dole. Yeah, but then I have a question. But how does that go back to D'Souza and Harry Reid on the the controversy and why would D'Souza would be in trouble for issuing a campaign donation uh, from a campaign fund when Harry Reid has absolutely nothing from the uh, Federal Election Committee regarding his money issued to his granddaughter? Well, the thing is, what 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 kind of the compared contrast is is that. 
um, you know, Dinesh's movie is a movie that's just going to confuse people. And, you know, we're kind of in the state of this country where, you know, we had an election that a lot of people argue was rigged by the IRS and the ATF and the FBI attacked, you know, opponents of Obama's election for years, for over a period of years, and kept them from participating in the election. So there's some doubt whether, you know, uh, should Romney, you know, should Romney actually be put in the presidency and Obama unseated if, if it was actually vote rigging. That would be well. There's been no be, proof of any of that. In well, fact, I, I I have to tell you, I've been following. I've been following all this. There's been very little evidence of any of that going on. What there's been is um, a lot of circumstantial evidence indicating that the the IRS. Well, Lois Lerner took the fifth, but there was something from the the consul, the right. president's consul, one of his lawyers, com communication with Lois Lerner. So that is kind of a. So who knows whether that there's ever well, yeah, there's see, unfortunately we gun. don't have that smoking gun. We won't have that smoking gun. And, but, but, just, but let's go back to Harry Reid here. But here we have Harry Reid giving money from his campaign accounts, which is totally illegal, to his granddaughter. Well, it's not so much that he gave the money to his granddaughter because he said they were for presidents for campaign contributors, but it was that he the forms the disclosure forms didn't look quite right, and so that's kind of a kind of a glaring thing there. And so, is that that big of a deal? No, it probably isn't. But just in compare to contrast, you know, Dinesh, he's looking at seven years, and Harry Reid's getting nothing. If they're both getting a ten thousand dollar fine or a five thousand dollar fine, you might say, well, that's kind of a fair. Well, Harry Reid has to pay back the money, doesn't he? <laughs> well, he said he'd write a check f to pay back his campaign, but he's not being fined. He's going to just write a personal check back to his own campaign. Well, that. The only problem with that is that's that's as though nothing happened then. Well, yeah, I mean, if you rob a bank, you just give the money back to the bank. But you know, so but it'd be cute if you could. But in this condition, you can't. Whereas on the other hand, uh, Dinesh had a five hundred thousand dollar bail, and so in essence, and he's still facing charges and still looking at. Well, seven years. I understand Dinesh also had a violation of some uh, restraining order or something. I mean, the guy had, uh, you know, not to, not to downplay his position on any of this. But the fact of the matter is, Dinesh and Harry Reid had two different subjects here. But I still question Harry Reid being able to give 17 grand to his granddaughter and then act like it was no big deal. I think it turned out to be 31 if you look at the Oh, 31 altogether. Yeah, I think if you add it up. Okay, speaking of 30, we, we're moving on to the next subject, which is about 1031 exchange in okay. real estate development. Okay, so what is a 1031 exchange? Well, a 1031 exchange is a situation where if you have a real estate sale and you you have capital gains on the real estate sale, the IRS allows you to trade uh, that real estate for another purchase, that the money from the first sale to a new purchase without paying capital gains tax on it. Right. But you have a short period of time to do it. You have to identify it within 45 and you have to complete it within 180 days. Right. And if you don't do that, then the IRS can come back to you and charge you capital gains tax on the difference of, of your purchase and the stepped-up basis for the sale of the real property. Right. And what's kind of interesting, uh, capital gains, I, I think it went up 7% from the 15, and plus uh, there may be, you could get it with another 3.8%. So it, I think that would be 25.8%. Well, well, the 3.8% you're talking about is actually part of what uh, was brought in the Affordable Care Act. Right. And that was one of the clauses that we had to read after we passed it. Well, that it. one was never delayed. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> never, that was never delayed. And the 3.8% sales tax yeah, yeah. on the sale of property for uh, really interesting how that is because that means that uh, instead of the, the, the straight exclusion of no sales tax, on your property, we now have a 3.8% sales tax on sales of real property before, which were excluded. Well, what happens with a, this is a DST, is a Delaware Statutory Trust, and what happens with the Delaware Statutory Trust is that um, several people can kind of uh, join together. And they used to do, uh, it used to be a tenants in common you do this. Right. But the problem with the tenants in common is that the bank, when it was giving out a loan, it would have to deal with each individual investor. So let's say you have a pool of investors who all want to throw in some money right. uh, to buy something that individually they wouldn't be able to afford, like they want to buy an apartment complex right. or something. So the Del Delaware Statutory Trust helps them do that. 
Um, and let's say, for example, you live someplace freezing cold or the taxes are going up like New York, and you say, well, I want to move to Florida and you want to retire. When you sell your New York, York property, you, you're, you're cash rich, but you're going to be hit with whatever this is. I, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I think maybe at 25, 20, 26 percent, you know, capital gains. Right. But if you do a 1031, but you might not be able to live or move, you know, so or, or move your your commercial property because this would be the the DSC is just for commercial. It's not for your uh, your, your your primary residence. Um, but if you want to move your investment down somewhere. Or let's say you were managing something and you just tired of managing it and you wanted to throw in with a bunch of people and hire a property manager. This gives people you know, a, a, a different mode than doing a tenancy in common. Okay, well, so then my question is, at this point then, what you're saying is uh, non-real, non-property that you live in, yeah, this would be a commercial roots, property, yeah. and now you can have groups come together and put money together. Individuals. Come individuals together. put money together so that they can utilize a 1031 right. trust to be able to buy a commercial property without having to pay capital gains on the properties they sold to earn that money. Essentially, if you would use the 1031 exchange but you would bind together with other people, and so there would be there's kind of brokers that help you meet those people that are under the same time constraint, and then maybe you would delay or speed up your sale of your property so you're in with this next batch. What other restrictions are there? Um, as far as are there other restrictions between the combination of the players that want to come in and put their monies together? Well, there is. You know, you might have a you know an upfront load of up to ten percent, so you might have to put in some some money up front. Uh, also, to for commercial properties, for a yearly fee, you might have 1% yearly fee. Or for a multifamily, you might have a 4% yearly fee. So you've got some fees and upfront costs that, that come in. But do, are those recurring? Uh, the, the, the yearly fee would be, yeah. The yearly yeah. fee is recurring. Right. And so is, is that a fee that's paid to who? Well, that's to run the DST. So now you've got someone, you know, you have a board or someone running. So instead of the bank dealing with, each individual investor and a tenancy in common, right? Uh, they would have the DST, whoever's right. running the trust. Right. And so that'd be for the person running the trust. Okay. So and so that would be actually the the Take manager care. of the yeah, trust. Well, the, yeah, the the trustee could be you know hiring the property manager and taking care of the taxes and doing. Well, doing how does job. that benefit our viewers as we talk about this today? Well, because right now a lot of people are in in a situation where they bought real estate. At a relatively lower value, it's gone up in value, um, but they may not have the energy or uh, want to stay where they are, and the prices are pretty high right now. So people want to want to dump that property and, and take the cash out of it, but they don't want to be hit with a uh, you know twenty five. Well, well, they, they definitely want to get the, the, the they don't want to get hit with the capital gains tax. There is an exemption on the sale of your property. You have an exemption every two years for that. But that's your primary residence. Yeah, it's your primary These residence. Primary. But if this is not a primary right. residence, you get none of that. Right. And then on top of that, you got the 3.8%, uh, the Affordable Care Act tax right. that's going to go on top of that. Right. So now you have a double three, three, whammy. 3.8%. 3.8%. Uh, 3 yeah, 3.8. Don't try to get away with that. I can't get, get away you. with that 3.8. 3.8 <laughs> is 3.8. Yeah, we know what that is. <laughs> And next thing you know, it'll be five. Yeah. And then it'll be seven. And then but the thing about it is, it's like also properties aren't as cheap as they used to be. So you may have to band together with several others in order to do a commercial property where you might have been able in the past to go, okay, I'm going to sell this commercial property here. And then I'll move down to Florida or somewhere in a warmer climb or wherever I want to move down to. And I will, uh, you know, do it on my own. But people can't afford, everything's gone up. So you might have to band together with nine other people in order to afford that property. So in reality, this benefits people that used to before be able to do this. Right. But now because of the value of the property is right. escalating because of the real estate values generally. Right. Now you can have more people still be able to take advantage of those real estate opportunities. And also the timeliness. I mean, you maybe, maybe you couldn't find something in 180 days on your own. Right. Well, that's a whole other problem. Right. That's why... And see, uh, before you sell, you better already be thinking well, about where that 180 saying. days, where you're going to be able to place yeah, the but money. See, when people are forming these DSTs, you might delay the sale of your property or speed it up so you get in with this next batch. Right. So, and in that case, then, there's... Uh, and then here's another thing. If you were if you were just going to buy, a, you know, a, like a single-family property, so here if you buy an apartment building, 
you might get a higher return on investment than you otherwise would if you buy them together with nine people. Your money can, can bring you more. Well, you should be able to have a higher buyer power if you're able to have a larger group of people. Yes, and also you may be able to get a higher return on your, you know, on your investment. Can the small guy do this? Yeah, small guy can do it. So that means a small guy, maybe with $100,000 or $50,000, could actually band together and probably make this something like that? That's probably not enough. You'd probably have to be, you know, I mean, you're better off being in the million dollar range. Okay, so you're, a small guy can't be really benefit from this. Well, a, small, a lot of small people, they, they're, selling, they're selling properties that are worth a million, but they can't move down and, like, say, if you got together, you could have 10 people with 10 million, yeah. and then you could get an apartment complex. You get a pretty good rate of re uh, return on your investment, right? And then that's for your retirement. So that's okay. what people are looking at for. Okay, so so well, most of this is, is for retirement, fun. retirement benefits, and I take well, it. Well, I mean that's that's where people are that are property that they've had, and maybe they were managing it themselves, and they're tired of collecting the rent. The property, tired of being the property manager, tired of maintaining the property, you know, and they want to throw in and have a you know apartment complex where they have a manager do this. Now you may be able to do it for less than a million. That's true, but I'm saying in general properties. Are pretty expensive, and they're probably looking for some for, for people, you know. Well, you're going to want to have a commercial property that has a high rental value, right. so you can have a generating in the rental income from the property. Right. And you probably that's number one. You got to be able to split that between the 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 group that does that. And also, you know, um, so looking back in 2006, uh, there was you know there was out of like say 341 tenants and commons that were put together, there was a uh, you know 3.7 billion dollars in deals. So. Um, you look at these deals, and they're they're reasonably high value, you know. So there's a fair amount of money in here, but uh, it is, you know, in a lot of cases, it would be a one-shot deal where someone was kind of, you know, they want to retire and they're hoping to, you know, live off this retirement deal. Well, they're hoping to have a generated income per right. monthly that uh, can keep them surviving without having to worry about collecting the rent, without having to worry about evicting people, without worrying about doing maintenance, you know. Okay. Well, so that okay. So now what ha so th we're talking about a long term holding of yeah, the usually, these properties. Yeah. Yeah, these properties it. aren't for turnover. Well, I guess you could. I mean, I I've no reason you couldn't. You'd probably sell out your interest. Okay. But I don't think that's really what it's set up for. It's really sold for a long term yeah. investment. It's set so up. this the guy small guy can kind of figure this out and if they can get themselves in on a um, say they sold a property and they had a million dollars of equity and they had were able to put it back in to something like this, they can be protected because they're going to have a management group making sure that their the property is protected. Right. Okay. And the money gets collected, and they get their and they get and they their, get their monthly dues as it's paid out, right, so to speak. Monthly. Dues. Okay, that's pretty good. Well, that's interesting. Is there? Okay, so I have a question though. Is that good for every state in the union? Yeah, you could form a DST and, and use it anyway. Okay. Uh, you could use it anyway. Oh, well, in that case, then, Mark, I think that was a really good subject, and I think we've called it for tonight. And I wanted to thank, uh, thank you tonight, Mark, for the subjects, a very interesting group of subjects. And I think what we have to do is look forward to the next month, and we'll have three more subjects for Law Talk. And I am sure we'll be able to raise some interest from the viewers. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. Good to see you.